Today's guest is Tim Hogan. He's a First Nations artist. He works with porcupine quills, birch bark, and sand from the St. John River. He shares his thoughts about art and its role in community. He also shares what it's been like to be First Nations living in our community and living in New Brunswick. And he talks about his time being in the military. All of these combine to have some impact on how he's an artist today. Hope you enjoy the interview. So maybe to begin our conversation today, why don't you explain how it is you became an artist? I guess uh, since I've been a little kid, I'd say my first inspiration was in grade one. I have uh, I had a teacher at school, and um, I wasn't always the best at writing or math or anything like that, and I want to, she's kind of always saying, you know, like, I like your drawings and things like that. So I brought her um, a picture from home that I used to draw quite often of the bird of paradise. And um, I, that's how I learned my scale was from back then looking at the, those pictures. And um, I gave her a picture of that. And uh, she said, well, maybe someday you could become an artist. And from hearing that from her and also my mom saying, you know, Tim, you're a very good drawer. Maybe you could do something with that someday. So I'd say way back in grade grade one or grade two was my first inspiration of becoming an artist. And I've been chasing it ever since. Hmm. You'd be chasing it for a while to come, I suppose. Yeah, a few bumps in the road between going here and there, you know. Sure. Serving with time and forces, and then I just, I keep coming back to this art. It's almost uh, as if it haunts me, and it has to, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it fulfills me. Yep, and and maybe something inside of you is itching away. It's like, no, I gotta, I, I gotta go do this. You've brought some pieces. Maybe that's a, a nice place to start. You want to... Do a bit of a show and tell with some of your pieces. Sure. This is um, this is my emblem that I wear to Pow House, and it's the the wolf wolf paw. My um my native name is Timberwolf, so I like to uh, um always and I it's also my spirit animal, so I feel feel very attached to the wolf. And um, these are wampum beads reproductions, um, synthetic, and this is the real wampum. Comes from a quahog shell. Um, this piece here, I was working on this at the Beaver Brook when I was an artist in residency there, and the same day that I finished this, sadly, um, Gord Downing passed away. And for me, he's, um, he's always been, you know, he's been there for our people, he's talked a lot, he's helped a lot of First Nations people, and his native name is Walks With Stars, so that's what I named this, and hope to touch it to his family sometime, actually, to get this to their family. I think it belongs there. Mm. Um, this here is the Wolf Warrior Mask. It's the first mask that I've done. I've uh, done it with uh, birch bark and I mended uh, two sides together. That's all the stitching and um, it's my way of doing three-dimensional masks. I can't no longer carve. So I've kind of took this as uh, my new way to do 3D work. Mm -hmm. And this mask here comes from sand from the St. John River with the little my children there, we spent some time on the islands in the St. John River. It's very, we love spending time there, kayaking, hanging out. And um, they gave me some sand. They told me special sand one day, and they said, well, maybe we, maybe we can do something at home with that, do some kind of art with it. So from there, I kind of took off into using that as a new medium. Mm -hmm. um, you do quill art. Quill art, yeah. Because the three of these pieces have a lot of quills in them. Mm-hmm. So an obvious question to an outsider is, uh, where do you get the quills? You run faster than a porcupine, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, well, you follow them to the roads. There's uh, here in New Brunswick. There's quite a few uh, places where they get hit where there's crossings, and uh, I'll have friends of mine. They'll call me or on my run to um, Miramichi. I do that run quite often. I've always uh, see a porcupine on the way down. If I don't see it on the way back. So I know it's uh, it was just hit by a car. So I'll go over and I'll, I'll process the quills. Um, I haul the porcupine off the road. I give it an offering and thank you for its offering for for um, giving me these quills to work with. And I um, take off the quills. I, I pet down the porcupine. I wear gloves because I yeah. get stuck a few times. They do hurt. <laughs> so I pet them down and I pet and pull technique. And it takes me about an hour to an hour and a half to clean a full porcupine. And there, there's up to thirty thousand quills in a porcupine, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of material for me to work with. I got four last year, so I think I'm good for the next two years. Okay. Depending on what size of quills I'm using. Hmm. Yeah. 
And then somewhere along the way, um, they find a home in a piece of your artwork. Yes. So do you have uh, maybe a peek into your process? Um, we can all somewhat easily picture a painter has a canvas, something goes click, uh, the first stroke goes on the canvas, and then something happens for the painter. Right. The writer has a blank page, they get started with a sentence or two, and then something happens. Mm -hmm. Do you have something similar? I guess I go with the images that are usually in my head or I get my dreams. I uh, think about, uh, well, for this one here, I wanted to, this is my second piece I've ever done. So I've, uh, my quills are my paintbrush now. I take a, a needle and I make small incisions in the, in the birch bark, usually in the winter bark, and I um, pull the quill through the other side. So each quill is two incisions in the bark, so you could be very very precise in where you put it because you know, if you make a mistake the mistakes there just like a tattoo right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh, yeah it's a uh, very time consuming work and it's but for me it's very rewarding i love every second of it so when you came up with mr downey's star tied to his first nation's name mm -hmm. but you had a pattern for that star in mind too um it's not a five point star it's it's that star yeah it's uh i guess i started off with the symbolism of the eight-pointed star it's some very um to the aboriginal people that's a real symbolic um geometric shapes mm -hmm. and i just i like to branch off that now i've been doing more stars since then and i've been really having fun with it and um yeah i think i'll move on with this it's uh it's simple you know you can but uh at the same time it's it's challenging mm -hmm. and, and no stars the same Yes, exactly. Well, with that stuff, nothing's it, the same. It fits the universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the most fun for you as you do this? Um, we can imagine, you know, the, the completion moment and you look at it and go, it's done. Or maybe you're one of those artists that's never done, but you have to let it go. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I guess it depends on if I'm making something for a commission piece for someone. That's very special to me. That's almost like getting a tattoo done. That is their symbol. That is, I think about that person as I'm doing the process and talk with them first and try to, you know, feel a bit of their energy. Like I can, I guess I can feel energy at times from people and, you know, positive and good. That's the easy ones. But, and um, especially if they're excited about it and it gets me excited. So I'm given, I always put my 100% heart into what I do. So no piece of my art is better than any other piece because every piece of art I do comes from my heart and I do it as the best that I can do. Hmm. I give it my all. So and there's no piece greater than another piece. Exactly. Do you have a favorite moment um, from doing that, working with someone, doing a commission piece? And, and none's better than any other, but for you, there may be one, there was some magic. Uh, yeah. Giving it to the owner. Yeah? Yeah, definitely giving it. I'm excited and want to get, you know, three quarters done and it's looking really good. I'm, I'm always like, oh, geez, maybe this is my best piece ever, you know? And I get excited and, yeah, to take it to the owner and just to see their expression or, you know, I like to get a little bit of a wow factor. If I get a wow factor myself, I really like to surprise somebody, Good. you know. Do you have a um, specific story related to that? Do you have a, a piece that you could describe say, I did this for this person, this is the energy I picked up off them, um, and this is what I turned it into? Mm. Well, I guess, well, just what's here on the table, all my stuff is kind of connected to a story in yeah. a way. But with this day, you know, this was a very sad day. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful star, I yes. assume, but it's, to me, it was a really sad day. And um, just thinking about what he did and, you know, and what a symbol he was for everyone, you know, and this, not just Canada, throughout the world. He was amazing, this, this music artist, right? Okay. And for me to play music... Uh, I feel that attachment with them because I know what it feels like to uh, to, to have that, to, to feel that the, the, the power from the music like goes through your body and to mm -hmm. attach with the rest of your band members and things like that. It's almost like almost like magic, I guess. Yeah, because yeah, there, there's another side to you um, who is also the magician, musician, not magician, magician with your artwork, but yeah. musician. So what instrument did you used to play? I, uh, I played drums. Yeah, and I, I play in a little band now we called the um, Higher Ground. Okay. And I play with some, actually some very talented musicians. I've, I was only into it about five years when I met up with them just a couple of years ago. So this is my second band I've been with. 
Right. And um, but they're all mostly members from the first band. They took me under their wing, and they're very experienced. And you know, they they put up with my my messing up here <laughs> in the beginning, but now we're we're getting pretty tight, you know, as a band. Do you find a correlation between music and your art? Yeah, I guess it's just the whole the whole creative thing. Like I find music very, especially drumming. I don't know if it's to do with my culture, or if it's in me, but I find that very grounding, and um, that's yeah, it's really rewarding to me. Either creating music or creating my art, it's just it feels natural. Hmm. Yeah. Sliding a bit back to your art, um, do you have opportunity to sell many pieces? Oh, well, I sold quite a few so far. I um, after my residency at the Beaverbrook, I sold. Um, some stuff out of there. I get some commission pieces. I get a few on the go now. I get a couple I got to make for August, a couple of turtles for a lady. And um, also Gallery on Queen, she carries my stuff, Nadia Corey, and she's a very nice lady. And she's uh, been carrying my quill work pretty much since day one. I've developed a relationship with her. And it's nice to have that kind of, um, you know, gallery right in, you know, right around where I live, that hometown. I'm looking to reach out to some new galleries. Mm. And um, because uh, I guess living off art, you got to, you got to get more than one gallery. Yeah, <laughs> try to reach out to the ones in, in different, all over the provinces and yep. through Canada sometime. It would be nice. Yeah. The obvious question is, any website presence yet uh, it's, online? It's in the works. I have a, a Timberwolf Quills, like a Facebook page sort of thing going on. And also I became recently a member of an art collective called Maui Art. And it's to do with all Aboriginal arts here in um here in the Maritimes, I believe, where it has started so far. But it's all stuff that has to be juried and things like that by members in the collective. Okay. And so it's it's really it's it's gonna be moving here. It just started recently, so Great. that's exciting to see gonna see that grow. Great. Yeah. The uh, the cultural bridge that art can create, do you see it um, playing a role in the future? I'm, I'm trying to play a, a little bit of the political world, um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, however the media might report that, um, whether it's good or bad or successful or not successful. But there's the rest of us just living a day and living in our community and looking for where the bridges can be built and where the connections can be made. Um, do you have any sense of how artistry can help build those bridges? Uh, we can look at a lot of the, the art from the past and... Um to see where is that you know it's kind of neat to look back in history 100 150 years ago 200 years ago this this could be the first form of embroidery uh is is quill work so it's that's kind of neat to look at that history part of it um back in the, they did do it in to the um residential schools mm -hmm. so that was a big part of canadian history is that the aboriginal kids they would do this kind of work and give the funds well to the the nuns and to, back to the churches so that was um, kind of the history part of it. For me, I didn't do a lot of time in church. It's uh, because of the history. So, but we're looking past a lot of things now with where 150 came through. Yep. And, um, you know, some things are starting to really come out in the open now and they're talking more about it, about families and what happened to them and, yep. you know, the children and what they went through. Like my grandmother was a residential school survivor. And um, it's, yeah, definitely... Um, set our mindset and religion to, to kind of go opposite way and try to dig up more and that's why I want to look more into my history and um, more or less the old ways the old ways of teaching as opposed to the new ways that are here at the um, you know schools today because a lot of it back then they believed that most of the teachings would come from within the home and the relatives and family would show them how to do things so I really want to pass my work on with that and also, I guess this is my way. I don't really want to learn my language. I'll save that for somebody else. I'm, I'm not really good in that area, but I think I can pass stuff down by doing traditional work and teaching kids how to, to do the trees and without damaging, my, you know, Mother Nature and yeah. things like that. I don't. I probably went off the topic a little bit. No, it is perfect. Okay, uh, good. No, because it was sort of a, a sideways question. Right. Um, because I'm bridging art and politics, but I was trying to pull it into the present and where connections can be made, where solutions can be found, where bridges can be built. Mm -hmm. Because um, in some sense, um, some of the narrative about uh, truth and reconciliation or relationship between white and native, um, well, some of the history starts to finally surface 
and it's necessary and it needs to be uh, made peace with. We also have to kind of get on with where we're going for the next hundred years. That's right. <laughs> you know, we so we need to kind of push and pull at the same time. And sometimes artists are the ones who know how to lead us in because they see down down the road mm -hmm. um, or they'll make peace with pieces from the past. So I guess that's where I was trying to play into it without putting you on the spot too much, but just know what your feelings are with that uh, living First Nations native in New Brunswick as an artist trying to make a career with a uh, family history and, and your own journey. Mm -hmm. And, and is this a place where it can happen? I believe so. I think things are a big change now, like um, to see what the artists are doing now as opposed to the past. Like we know what the artists did in the past. First Nations people not just doing their art. They did it to uh, symbolize stuff like, okay, like this is my pot. There's designs on that. You know, that's such and such pot when you go to do dishes at the end of the day sort of thing, right? And um, so they did symbolism not just for art but for to know what's theirs. So the art and form with today, um, you see a lot of uh, people branching off into doing videos and things like that and doing um, Natalie Sapier um, as, as one, you know, she's doing a lot of performances now and things like that at the Playhouse level. So it's really exciting. And um, Ned Bear doing with the mass, you know, that's more from out west kind of feel, but he's really brought mass to Canada, like not Canada, but I mean the Maritimes. So I think that it can also say a thousand words or more. So with my art coming up, I like to do some, maybe like a show outside and just to show like how the attachments of Mother Earth and how everything comes together, how everything's attached right through from the trees to the roots to the, you know, our job here as a First Nations people was supposed to be set up for the next seven generations of, uh, humans living here to help this world sustain itself so one of our biggest jobs was to be between the ground and the moon he who walks at night we're supposed to keep the balance of that that's the job of the humans from the part of the creation story hmm. yeah. wouldn't it be interesting to weave that into the narrative of the next provincial election <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're giggling but I'm thinking you know there's a lot of leadership that can be had with the things that you could teach us and, and First Nations culture could teach us with what's missing for the current narrative with how we're approaching our relationship with so many things mm -hmm. I had a lot of touches with that working at the Beaverbrook you know a lot of people come in people coming from all different places and just to be able to talk about my art and you know, some people, they'd walk by the door and I'd, I'd wave them in, you know, and give them a smile. Like, I, I want to talk about this stuff. And, you know, that's why I'm here as artist in residency. Like, feel free to, to ask me any questions about art. And, um, like, I won't, I'm not the kind of guy that, that draws on things that are, uh, like, I don't get upset if somebody says the wrong thing or anything like that. Like, I'm open to hear anything. I'm not, uh, I'm very, uh. Like an outgoing, easy-going person to talk to, I guess. So you make, yeah, you make it easy for people. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, because you listen, which is great. Um, is there anything more we can explore in, in that what First Nations culture could teach white culture or European-based culture for where we need to go for the next 20 years, 30 years? Um, I really like the, the seven-generation thing, which I've heard before, but especially walking between the land and the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, that relationship to space and a sense of time and place, too. Um, do, you have, do you have some f thoughts about where we need to go, whether it's art-related or whether it's just community-related? What would you like to see start to shift and change? Yeah, maybe in the education part, I'd like to see, you know, I know they're going in the right direction with the, the children in schools now, like First Nations children, but I don't think it should be just open to First Nations children. I think it should be open to all children. I think we should explore our history more here than as opposed to the, the American history that we hear about in schools. So I, I see change in that now. They're looking more in Canadian history and things like that and realizing that, uh, okay, all of us here together trying to live in Canada at one time was a very hard place to live. And if we didn't all come together, a lot of us would have died off more. than. So we help, really helped each other to teach each other how to grow and 
you know, from different parts of the world into survival at the end of it. So that was a good teaching from way back. Right now, I believe the, the salmon, that's, that's kind of scaring me. And uh, also, like, the deer, like, you just see everything starting to vanish off. Like, it'd almost be impossible to live off the land these days and to get what you would need to survive. So that's something that they had in the past was having that option to live off the land. And now we really get a look at the grocery stores, and it, it scares me what's in this food and stuff like that. What is it about it that scares you? Uh, the dice, that's a big part of it. And, um, you know, all the steroids that's put into the, the foods and things like that. But then again, our animals, we are what we eat. So in our animals here today, um, the pollution and things, everything, eating the fish out of the rivers, like we don't know, maybe we don't know everything that's in that. And I seen a girl from uh, Nunavut one time. She come and try to spend some time here um, to go into the, the farm forces. They had to fly in caribou and whale blubber because our food was poisoning her a lot bad that the next day after eating it, she was throwing up. And then it, when she ate our food here, within half an hour, she's thrown up. So it just shows that, yeah, there is some stuff in our foods because she's pure. She was actually born in an igloo. <laughs> Are you still in touch with her? Uh, no, that was, a while ago. it would have been 2000, around 2000, the last time I seen her. And she's from Nunavut, yeah. So here we are in New Brunswick doing what we do, thinking everything's okay, but you have experience of maybe it's not so okay. Mm -hmm. Food supply, food security, um, so is that an area that you have thoughts of how we could make better? Yeah, I think we got to get more back to the gardening, you know, growing our own foods and... Um, I think that's that should be teaching that everybody knows, like a common knowledge to build mm -hmm. a grow young garden. Because look at uh, can we mass produce and we're bringing in food from everywhere. It's just making it hard for the farmers here, and yeah. you know, throughout the maritimes, they're uh, they're getting a lot of people. They're getting out of it. So, mm -hmm. what are we going to do for ourselves? Did that um, cross your family history, or did anyone in your family teach you how to grow food, or are you that generation that it skipped? <laughs> uh, kind of skip me away. I used to pick potato bugs for my dad, so but I'm starting like the last couple of years to start to grow some vegetables again yeah. in my yard. Yeah. And um, but I remember as a kid, uh, one time there was um, spraying going on not far from our house. We had a huge garden, had a barn before I was born. I used to have animals and cattle and stuff like that there. And um, yeah, mom said one day she woke up, they went out to the, the garden, and uh, everything was dead. So something was sprayed here and you know and, not, not far from our house and and whereabouts would this be oh uh, we live i live alongside the saint john um okay river between um cp gauge down or mocto area okay so so the spraying happened somewhere around there yeah how but, long ago was that uh i would say around probably around 30 35 years ago all right yeah no fun and of course you didn't know it was coming did you yeah, but it's hard to save a spraying for sure, but that's how else does everything die? Just like yeah, randomly it, just die. And it wasn't a frost. No. 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 Well, that was kind of scary thought yeah. too. The, uh, but the whole notion of food security and food supply um, is another one that would be nice to get into the next coming election. And I'm always steering back to election because that's one of those moments in time where everybody's supposed to come together and have conversations about what's important to them. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of times that narrative is driven by the business community and it tends to be about debts, deficits, job creation, those things, and, and not about community well-being. I mean, it's in the mix, but it's not top of the list. And then food security, um, preserving our water. So when I think of those things, and for the little bit of awareness I have, I want to turn to First Nations peoples and say, help. <laughs> <laughs> because it's more woven into your fabric than it is into the white culture fabric. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Kind of. Yeah. They, um, there's a lot of old teachings, a lot of, you know, that they should be shared. A lot of the, the elders are passing on now, and um, hmm. it's it's hard to say where it's, it's going to go in the next uh, 20 years, but I'm really hoping it's going to be a lot focused on the environment. Because hmm. I worked at the Canton Fence on the Nashua River, one time and I could see like the numbers and I I ask every year okay how are the numbers this year is there more 
wilders or more hatchery and things like that hmm. and the hatchery salmon and wild when they combine they're not as strong as a regular wild salmon so a lot of times this is what people are telling me they don't make it back to do their spawning hmm. so we're really losing that and also the migration of the um the striped bass they're uh, tending to eat the salmon eggs huh. so I, I did that in one of my works not long ago I, I created a salmon it didn't last more than a week that I had this piece to look at a lady her her son worked with salmon for years and she just had to have it she got it for Christmas for him so that was nice it's nice when work goes to the right people those attachments and I didn't know who it was going to be for so that's another <laughs> surprise right that's that's a nice story yeah the uh because it found the right home mm -hmm. the um maybe diverting a little bit uh more about you. Okay. Um, when we were warming up a bit, you talked about um, serving some time in the military. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe what that was like? And how long ago, and what did you do? And All right, well, it was uh, back in 2000, yeah, 2000s when I joined. And I served time in, in uh, Halifax. I, w I went to the Navy first, so I did there. I get to sail out in some international waters, and that was quite fun. I didn't go out see a lot of uh you know overseas countries but we went out and did some pirate sea kind of thing okay in international waters and fish pads like checking out people's fish quotums and things like that good and um well that was that was very best good good single man life i guess because uh, after my son was born uh, a couple years later i decided i wasn't gonna that wasn't the right route for me i want to be more part of his life and i could see that the navy was going to be a lot of sailing so i finished up my one contract with them but I, uh, you know, I got, I got damaged within that time. I, uh, I went under operation. I got my root canals, uh, not root canals, but wisdom teeth taken out. And um, during that procedure, something went wrong. I, uh, I went up there. They put me under the needle. I felt excruciating pain um, through my body. And I, I felt like that I died. So I, I passed out from the pain. I woke up during the procedure when they're doing work on my mouth. And I was trying to yell at them and trying to move so I couldn't move so I felt like I died and the only thing that came back that I had in my brain and my vision to look because I couldn't say nothing and I couldn't move so that was a really scary experience for me that's uh, part of uh, what I'm dealing with now as yeah. opposed to um, yeah so that was in 2005 so quite a few years later that that was a part of my um, PTSD they diagnosed me with uh, just a few months ago so with not sleeping being on guard all the time a lot of that stuff uh now it's like okay this is why this stuff was happening yep fascinating and that came from some major surgery in your mouth mm -hmm. but was this um while you were still in the military it was when i was in the service yeah so you must have had a lot of questions for a number of years about why you're while you're reacting or moving through the world the way you're moving through yeah the world. that's right there's a you know a lot of stuff going on a lot of things i didn't know what was going on and um are you comfortable describing any of that yeah i uh i don't sleep much hmm. that's that's one thing i get from that i don't sleep i um have anxiety mm -hmm. uh depression um you know i get depressed sometimes but i've been through a major depression I hit rock bottom of it. it took me quite a few years later hmm. but I yeah I hit the bottom of that where I didn't think there was no coming back for me and within doing stuff that I do and you know maybe if I didn't have my children yeah. I might not have uh, bet it but one day I woke up which was after I hit rock bottom it was months and months that I was battling I was like a lot of pain like really painful and um I didn't know if I was going to come back from it, like I said. And uh, one day I woke up and the, the sun was brighter that day. And um, so I think if you, if you could just hold on that little bit longer and then days started to get a little better. And then I followed my worst year, followed with like my best year after that. So after my, you know, my separation with my wife, my children were away from me at this point. It was really hard for me to, uh, yeah, to go, to basically start over. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, I, I bet it, and um, I don't. Uh, I hope that it never comes back again. But I guess you, you never know, right? Yep. Was there any one thing when it started to turn? Can you describe 
what that was like when it started to be lighter or is it as simple as one day was a bit better and the next day was a bit better yeah it just started to like build back up again and then i i knew from that point i was like well i i, I beat this and um you know i just want to move forward from here so when you hit rock bottom you got to shoot up from there so there's no other place to go but up yeah and i um went up for quite a bit and i decided to go back that's when i at the point i'm going to go to art school i'm going to do what i wanted to do from the beginning i'm going to follow my my goals and you know follow my heart chase my dreams and um i wasn't too long into it i was about half a year into it and i was a wood carver and that was what i intended on doing at school and I get in an accident. I had 75 pounds from a overhead thing in a garage falling my head, put me into a concussion. So at this point, that beat me down. I couldn't no longer run. I tried to run, and I used to be, uh, I used to run marathons before this happened to me, and pound numerous hours on a hammer and chisel. Um, so there, there I was, and and I don't. I think if I didn't just beat depression. A year prior to that, I think that would have sent me into it, because that took away my passions. Hmm. It wasn't long after I found this quilt work, okay. and uh, you know, so I, I just for a joke at times I say, "Look, I get hit on the head for a reason because I really enjoy what I do," <laughs> and uh, that's what I say to people. And um, it's been about two and a half years now, and I'm still um, fighting with it. Sometimes I have a hard time spitting out words and things like that, but it's uh, it's getting better. And I, um, I hope to someday be able to run again. That's yeah. really one of my goals. So when you used to run a lot, um, do you have a personal best? Uh, I like the fact that I get to compete against myself. Huh. Yeah, that was the main thing for me. And to run, I think back in the day, I think it's kind of, it went into my roots where we used to have to chase our food. And so I think it's genetics because I was a 190 pound guy running marathons half marathons and doing it in really good times so i was a pretty good <laughs> sized guy for running yeah. against the guys that are 120 pounds 130 pounds yeah if it had been 150 years ago you'd be a terror <laughs> yeah <laughs> like think so. out here comes tim well, we can't compete with him <laughs> yeah that was that was good that was nice to have that i guess competing against myself I always push myself to my own limits mm -hmm. not not about other people because i wasn't like a sports person in school or anything like that yeah i was more of the guy that would uh enjoyed his art class <laughs> yeah and, and it's about the soul of it mm -hmm. rather than the competition of it yeah yeah you get that little i guess that runner's high yeah that they call it that that's a good feeling yeah and, and it nurtured something in you too um your spirit i want to wander into uh, you've talked about these powerful life moments um it's almost like someone was giving you a plank and said no tim go this way mm -hmm. um do you have any sense, and if you don't want to answer, that's fine, but do you have any sense of if there's spirit guides um, moving you, guiding you, do you, um, either through your own practice or uh, maybe cultural context, have a sense of that you're protected and you're being guided, and can you speak to that a bit? Sure. Yeah, actually I do. I uh, since, since the accident, uh, I kind of felt down, and I've been asking things after that, okay, why, and how am I going to get by this? And, you know, and, um, I've been seeing a lot of 11s, 11, 11. Yep. And I even <laughs> put it into my work these days. I hide some 11s in there sometimes. And I really don't know, but it's sometimes could be up to a few times a day that I see this. Yeah. It could be on license plates, could be just, you know, random number comes up timing on my phone or see the wake up at 11, 11 at, at night, you know, yep. after dozing off a little bit. And, yep. Cause I don't sleep much until the wee morning. Yeah. is when I usually sleep. So a lot of time I'm watching to wake up, look at the clock, wake yeah. up. But it's usually, I see a lot of 11s. And um, spiritually, like I I feel good. Like even what got, got me down, I still feel very positive about it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think this this work, the, it sent me in a totally different direction that I never thought I'd be working with porcupine quills. Sure. I, I was a hardcore carver, you know, as a, a labor that's the kind of work that I did labor of love and um so this is a different kind of labor I got to slow down <laughs> you know <laughs> not just the running part of it now I'm yeah. more or less riding a bicycle right so that's that's my way I'm just kidding and uh well quilt work is very slow 
Yep. Like a piece like this could take me up to two weeks to build that, mm -hmm. mending it, processing it, yep. getting it all together. So yeah, slow work. And um, I like to hand that down to uh, other people that uh, enjoy this uh, type of work at art school because a lot of people are there. They're on a path and it's it's not an easy thing to become an artist and to uh you're just throwing yourself out there and you're throwing your work out there yeah. people are worried about that so it's kind of my spiritual path and has guided me that way so i'm not afraid anymore have you ever been visited by spirit guide where you heard a voice and i uh or something in similar? my dreams i've uh felt uh you know mother mother earth like maybe representing asking me to maybe help her out and like I could see dreams of a lady growing out of a tree and it relates to the old uh, part of the um, creation story Glooscap cap shot the arrow in a tree and all the beautiful people came out and um, it's not re just representing the Aboriginal part of it it's all the races it's all the colors you'll see the color wheel yellow red black and white yep. it's all representing all the beautiful people so it's not just my people yep so yeah, I, I do. I feel that I've I've seen spirits in the, in the past. So I do believe in can you, you know, the spirit world? Sure. Yeah. Can you describe one of those moments? Is that possible? I um I was in Cape Breton one time with a group of kids, and we were just walking around, going down through the, the reservation down there. I've it was the first time I've ever been there. I was down to visit a great aunt, and I never even knew these guys, and um, they looked over next to me and there was like a form that was kind of glowing green and it was a form of um almost like a wolf that's how they could explain it and i looked beside me and i not just i seen it we all seen it so that that there just showed me at that point that okay this ain't just my mind playing tricks here <laughs> there's something there and these kids are freaking out around me i don't even know these kids yep right so from that point and i I just seen I can feel things at times on different areas and um, you know if I'm walking out to the woods sometimes you get creeped out you feel the hair up on your neck and you just know that something happened there you know something way back mm -hmm. who knows what could happen on any bits of this land around here throughout our history you know something was there you can just feel when something's around thank you it's it's fascinating because there are some who are in tune to varying degrees of that level of awareness of um, there's a lot more going on than just what's on the surface yeah i feel that way anyway and and that just like i said it was, wasn't just me that seen it was others and they explained the same thing that i seen so an obvious question would be did you feel safe uh no this one wasn't wasn't a safe one no uh, we all ran okay you no know, we were we were afraid we didn't know what to do we we're just in shock kind of Mm -hmm. before we, the first kid took off and then we all followed but um did you get but, to talk to anyone about it to try to interpret it or make sense of that we did that night we went back to my my aunts and talked about it and stuff but those kids i haven't seen even seen them since then you know? <laughs> next time you show up they're going to be going ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's quite a few years ago but yeah. yeah i think you can feel when bad stuff's going on or when there's good energy or bad energy mm -hmm. and uh i tend to feel energy i guess yeah which at some point will make its way through your your quills and your hands i hope that to, to become more where i can understand it more someday mm -hmm. maybe i'm going to chase that path a little bit more yeah. related but to support the the military part of your life um what inspired you to join the military um i guess a lot of it was movies and like just playing war games as a kid and Later on in life, I was like, well, it's kind of modern warrior sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a month after 9-11 happened that I got on that plane to go to basic training. All right. And I went there first. It was all Aboriginal group of children. Well, I call them children because we were kids, really. Yeah. How and, old were you? 17, 18? Uh, I was 19 okay. when, I went, when I went there. But there was some there that was as young as uh, 16, 17. It's called... Uh, pre-recruit training prtc they called it okay and we were the second group it was all aboriginal kids and then from there i think there's there's maybe like six of us that that made it through the program it was like tougher than basic training huh. and basic training is 13 weeks and so 
kind of thing. There's only a few of us that graduated and moved on to the reg force wow. from there. So it was, uh, basic training was, uh, walking apart for, for some of that stuff that went on with that. I think they were a little tough on us, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, why would it be different? Yeah. It's supposed to be all fun. There was some fun stuff that happened there, but you know, there were some things said and stuff like that that should never have been done, you know? So that slides into the racism that's not even just under the surface. Um, it's right on the surface. Yeah, I've I've always, uh, you know, felt that from certain people. Like, even just walking into grocery stores. You know, I just kind of look over my shoulder at times. And I don't feel paranoid anymore because I know within my towns that people know me. They know I'm not there to take stuff. Or anywhere you go. But you're always going to feel that, that uh, stigma against that, I guess. Racism. Is it fair to ask, does it make you angry? Uh, not really, but I, I find it's easier to focus on for anybody. You know, if they don't look like you, if they look a little bit different, like different races, like it's easy to, well, let's say reserves. It's easy to focus on reserves because they're all together. They're not expanded out. I was never raised on reserve. I was always off reserve my whole life. My families were mostly farmers and things like that down in Burton area like my dad's uh, he's Irish comes from Miramichi so I'm half Irish and half Malsey that's my background with that but yeah. it's uh, I kind of get off track with that question there it was about do you feel angry sometimes and oh, you're yes. picking up energy going through a grocery store and, and yeah yeah it does kind of tick me off in a way you know have you ever had a chance to educate someone <laughs> I did oh, yeah. I had a, quite a few people over the years say wow I've uh Never met too many um, native people before, and um, we get to talk to them, to this, you know. And I, I feel cool with you, and you know, I'm glad I get to talk to you. I didn't know what to expect yeah. to talk to you, and that's you know, at the Beaverbrook too. And I was sitting there. I think that's why a lot of people, well, some people were afraid to, they just walk by the room, and I'd wave them in or go, hey, do you want to come on in? Like, yeah. come have a chat. They're afraid, maybe, what I have to say. So some of that hesitation was connected to. First Nations or them not knowing how to handle it or yeah or not knowing how to talk to other races or worried about you know maybe just being afraid maybe they never met too many people yeah that were um First Nations so that just provides a direction where we should go which is building community together and having those conversations yeah I see it going like in a positive direction right now mm -hmm. that part of the community because I know it's not as bad as it used to be Mm -hmm. um, a related story from a past guest, Brandon Mitchell, um, First Nations, Mi'kmaq. Um, hope I have that correct. <laughs> um, but Brandon tells the story of uh, living with his wife and the two kids in Ottawa for a while because they wanted to expose the kids to that. And then his son came home from school one day, 13 or 14. Hey, Dad, we learned about Indians in school today. Mm -hmm. Or native, you know, I forget which one he used, but he was comfortable with saying Indian. And uh, he goes, yeah, you learned about us. And so, no, no, I learned about natives at school today. And Brandon goes, no, no, you learned about us. Yeah. <laughs> and as Brandon says, he's a lovely sense of humor. And he looked at his wife and said, we got to move back home. <laughs> so the son or the children can remember and know who they are mm -hmm. rather than he was experiencing his son not being aware of. That's what they were studying in school was his family. Yeah. So it's it's. I know the last generation had a lot more things going on than, than me. So that, that just shows that we are going in a, in a better direction, you know, because I hear stories from aunts and uncles and stuff and uh, telling things of what happened to them, you know. They're, well, at least they're not beating people in schools anymore. Yeah. You know, that's one good thing. And they're recognizing people's cultures and how people learn differently because I, you know, really, frankly, we only come out of teepees 200 years ago. And um, so a lot of this, you know, I don't say colonialism. Yes. Or, yeah. So education is uh, different. Not everybody's learns at the the same way or the same pace and things like that. So I'm kind of decolonizing myself from computers because they stress <laughs> me out. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, a lot of people know me for that days. Okay, my <laughs> biggest computer is my phone. I haven't owned a computer since 1998. My parents bought me one through for uh, university. And I joined the army after that. I didn't even hardly use it. I used it for Napster before that became illegal. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that's my computers for music and that's it. Yep. But there's something to that, though, because it's about a way of life. 
and that way of life might reintegrate our relationship with the land a bit better. Whether we've got the cis and mine issue that's cooking up again in the Fredericton area or um, any industrial kind of development, uh, it needs to have more circular thinking to it. Mm. And the culture that knows that best is First Nations culture. So I wonder sometimes about the opportunity for teachings from First Nations culture moving forward to 2020 and 2030. Yeah. Um, how one can complement the other and, and kind of find a better balance. I guess like uh, creativity is going to play a big role coming up. We got to really think about the changes and what's going on and you need those creative thoughts, you know, flowing through people because the industrial is gone, the baby boomer has gone, you know, it's yeah. looking in a different direction and it's just going to be just survival soon with the water, you know. What do we have to drink? Uh, it's... Yeah, we have to look at things differently. Yeah, and with the shifts in food supply or climate change, um, becoming more self-sufficient, mm -hmm. which kind of harkens back to a hundred years ago and First Nations culture, knowing how to live in a better relationship with the land. Yeah, I'd like to learn more about it myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, yeah, there is that, the passing down from the generations. Yeah, we lost a lot of that, you know. Mm -hmm. I have what my, my parents taught me there, really good in that, that area, you know, making me, you know, self-sufficient from a young age, like, mm -hmm. I learned how to sew, I learned how to cook, you know, mm -hmm. they were there for that, dad tapping on the steering wheel, that's what made me become a drummer, I believe, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing, and, um, yeah, uh, off the, um, what well, is it different for you living off reserve? I mean, by design, it's different, but do you have thoughts about that? It was because I was pretty much that at first uh, brought up in a small school, Burton School. My whole family's been through there. Like when I was there, we moved from it went from grade one to grade six, and then my last it was during my time that I was there. It only went from grade one to grade three. So I was with my brothers there for one year, and then moving to Ormacto, I didn't even know what a reserve was till I moved to Ormacto to go to school in Ormacto. You know, I, I, I knew it was a community, but I wasn't ever told that it was that name. And I met cousins that I didn't really know. And like, and it's only, what, 10 minutes up the road? Yeah, fascinating. And so I met a whole new family and things like that. And then I've always been attached with both. And that's when I first picked up on racism was some kids in school. And so that was when I went to Ormuk, though. That was <sighs> the first time I felt it. Hmm. Yeah, and then from there, you know, you know about it and learn more about it and hear about it so it's a, it's a horrible thing yeah mm -hmm. it's a horrible thing yeah. and it needs some kindness to make it better and a whole lot of education and building bridges yes. to um, turn this for the last five minutes or so um you brought a piece of art with you that we have sitting off on the side mm -hmm. and uh um can you describe it a little bit while we uh, show a picture of it um this is with mother nature within the um the trees uh just being attachment as kids walking into the woods and um like the trees is, you can hear them blowing today yeah <laughs> but um i've always felt an attachment to trees and i i think that's to do with uh with our roots and um how important they are and recently they're talking trees can talk hmm. communicate mm -hmm. i wouldn't say to talk to each other but communicate and help heal each other and things like that and um so i want to build a piece that represented that and then through the old stories of the creation story and um so mother mother nat mother earth mother nature is my largest inspiration and so i want to create her in a three-dimensional form so it's more or less uh doing work that's outside of what I normally do. So it's an independent study in a way, mm -hmm. but I think I nailed it. <laughs> Cause I can't carve it no more. So I had to build up paper and then I do the inner bark, the outer bark, and just to make it as realistic as possible mm. by using the supplies from nature without damaging the trees. Do you have a name for the piece? I call it emerging. Emerging. Yeah. I get a series of emerging, I guess, uh, not really attached to me, but I thought about it after because I'm in my emerging years as an artist. Hmm. But it's just emerging. She's emerging out of the tree, Mother Mother Nature. I have that same thing tattooed on my leg. And it's, it was a dream I had when I was in my teens. 
Yeah. Do you remember the dream? Yeah, it was a uh, mother nature emerging from a tree. Okay. Yeah. That that literal. That wasn't scary, was it? No. <laughs> No, it's kind of cool, really. And I just, it's always been drawn to me. Always been drawn to that, to to follow that and to try to figure out why. Or I think it's just uh, maybe I get to help get her messages out there. Mm-hmm. I like to, you know, on the earth. Mm-hmm. I get to learn more about the, the seven generations. But mm-hmm. to think about that, what would that bring you seven generations from now? We're 2018, so I'd be, what? Seven is 140 years. 20, 20 years of generation. So it would be. Does that work? Uh, so they say we got a hundred years to live. <laughs> it's ways away. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to think yeah. that far into the future and what we're going to need at that point. But I guess baby steps. Uh, I think our steps got to get a bit bigger here soon because things are really yeah. starting to fall apart. Yeah, you know, we got to get reconnect with the ground again. We do, and and work together as people. Yeah. Any final thoughts for us? Oh. It's, Follow your heart and don't be afraid to, you know, to do what's uh, the step outside of your comfort zone. Uh, I think that's where the magic happens. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.